So I am at Microsoft. I've uh, started my career in Microsoft Research, and it's been really great to think about how um, we can take all of the speech and language, vision technologies that we have, and really bring it um, as quickly and as openly as possible to lots of companies and people and partners um, who can use these tools to build their own solutions. So I'm going to tell you three stories today. Um, the first one is sort of about ancient history. Uh, the second one is about this really cool experiment that we've been doing in China that you probably haven't heard of and just how inspired we are by the um, ecosystem around WeChat and Chinese culture and how AI is really um, taking off in other countries. Um, and then I'll talk about a lot of the tools that we have to offer and how you can use them. Um, so, so this was probably the first conversational experience. We had this dream, I think a long time ago, that every computer would be able to have dialogue with you. And it's a very primitive kind of dialogue. Um, thank goodness we've progressed a long way, um, which is very brittle. But I think we've always had this dream that you could say something to the computer and it could respond to you. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a bit. Um, we, we, uh, we came up with this really amazing thing called the web browser. And I think when you think of the web browser, uh, today we, really, uh, we were really pretty naive when we said web browser or mobile phone. We really didn't have a lot of the questions that we have when we say we're inventing AI. Like what is the impact that it's going to have on your company and how disruptive is it going to be? Well, I think two of the coolest inventions of the web browser were really uh, user experience inventions. First, there was the back button. So if you think about your desktop at the time, um, there is no back button. You can't go back to what you saw last, um, and there's no home. And back was really critical because you were looking at other people's stuff way more than your own. Um, you know, so, so it really changed the way you navigate and search and find things and really helped you look at things not that you created, but things that other people created a lot more. And it's really transformed the way that we share. So if you think of conversation, um, these UI metaphors, they, they're kind of different. Because if I said, or you looked at me and you said back, I'd be like, blah, I got, I, my mind doesn't work that way. I can't really think of what you mean when you say go back in conversation. Do you mean repeat what you just said? Do you mean I didn't really understand? And I would sort of interpret what you said when you said you wouldn't really say back. You'd say something like, huh? <laughs> and, um, and I would kind of interpret what you said, and then I would either repeat it or clarify. Um, and so even the most simple things that we think about when we think of conversation and dialogue are really different when you're talking and speaking or even texting than they are when you have a screen in front of you and you know single user, when you click back, you're going to see that thing that you just saw. By the way, when you navigate in a GPS, you also don't tell your GPS back. Time and conversation and time moving in space always goes forward. Like even if you say repeat, I'm thinking time is forward. I didn't like teleport back in time and like say what I just said. And, and it's really hard for me to even think that way. Um, so this is kind of a fun example. Uh, one of the first things that we saw people doing when we started providing a lot of these conversational AI tools, people have a database. Let's say it's a database of apartments. And they want to be able to do natural language query over that. So show me two or three bedroom apartments in Kirkland, which is a city near, near me, up, up north, for under 600K. Um, that's probably definitely not here, so that's like, can't find that. Okay, so you'd be like, what? No. So, um, so the dev that was working on this, you know, in search, you're either refining your results, you're narrowing, or sometimes in a query, you don't have enough results, so you want to expand out. So he said, you know, you could say, like, how do you want to refine this? And you can refine it by region or city or type, and, you know, and you can have a visual UI along with a spoken UI um, or cards. And I was like, dude, nobody says refine. I don't even know what that means. Like, you just want it to work for you. You want this to narrow your results or widen your results based on what you think is the right thing. And if you're not sure, you need to ask. So it's just interesting. Even basic things like search, um, nobody wants to see 10 search results in a conversational app. You, you know, so you have to be more likely to be right on the first hit. So I just want to say AI sounds really complicated and hard, but sometimes I think the innovations that we're going to have, just like that back button, the address bar, search, um, they seem so obvious today. And I think we're still at this point where how can we make um, having dialogue, just like we have as people, 
easier, better, and a lot of the inventions might be um, invented by our AI researchers, and we have a lot of those, and lots of companies have a lot of those, but a lot of them might just be experiential and just really different, and I love these examples because I think our goal is that everybody participates in AI. You know, it's not just a few companies who are fortunate enough to have um, in schools um, who, who got a head start. Um, so people, you know, digital computers um, aren't binary. We don't think in ones and zeros. That really rigid grid of, you know, files on your computer is always kind of irritating to people like me. You kind of want to shake it up because people are messy. Um, and AI is really cool because it's vector-based. It's, it's kind of in its soul a little bit more the way people think um, and uh, just like conversation. So that's my first story. Um, my second story, like I said, was sort of started in China. And this I found on the web. I love it. It is fan art of a chatbot that we made called Xiao Ice. And Xiao Ice, um, it started as a hackathon project uh, from the Bing team. Xiao Ice actually means little Bing. And uh, they released it on WeChat. And it just went crazy popular. Of course, WeChat immediately shut it down. Um, and so you're supposed to laugh there, but you didn't. <laughs> So, uh, so we've just been we've just been pushing this because I don't know if you uh, how many of you know what WeChat is. WeChat is one of the most popular chat apps in China. Um, if you go to China, install it on your phone before you go, so you because if you don't have your QR code to meet people in business, um, I mean it's just standard. It's your business card and pretty much everything that you could possibly want to do. There's an app in China um, in WeChat that is just conversationally enabled, and, and that's how business gets done. Everything gets done there um, through WeChat. It's super cool. What's really interesting is we have many, many third-party characters powered by the same um, conversation engine. So most of you probably don't play Pokemon all that much in Japan, but um, that's one of my favorite ones. The Pokemon characters are really powered by this engine in Japan. And um, just like us, a lot of the brands are really interested in engagement. Um, and, and so we've just been kind of riffing on that and playing with it. Um, so we have many um, customers and companies, especially in the Far East, in India, um, China, Japan, that are using this system. And not only is it text-based and voice-based, but they actually are video-based. And it's just, it's just really cool. Um, so Xiao Ice today has over 660 million users. Um, and again, the engagement is something that we're looking at. How many chat pairs, how long do people spend engaging What's interesting? And how can we make it more interesting? Um, in China, there are many, like I just thought this was cool because I was looking at all the press on Show Ice and I was like, wow, I don't even know these publications. So I just want to remind us that even though we are sort of at the epicenter of tech, you know, in the US, there's, there's just a lot happening and we have to keep our eyes out and learn from all the inspiring work that's happening um, in so many other countries. Um, so one of the things that's different maybe about this um, goal to really engage people is we are looking a little bit, we've learned that um, uh, um, just earlier you heard a lot about single turn conversation or multiple turns. So this is like at the very, you know, beginning of intelligence. Because usually if you say something, you expect the person to be able to like remember what I just said. <laughs> Not like you say something and then I've forgotten what you said. So now we can do multi-turn, which is like I can remember what you said in a session. But we really want to be able to remember not only did do you have memory in one session or one sentence and then multiple sentences, but then over time, how do you how do you actually have more memory and history of, of what people say? And so we're just looking at how we can do this in really interesting ways. And we're just focusing in on conversation itself. So, you know, there's single turn, there's multi turn, there's kind of ways that you can continually lessen as a session. And we're really looking at a um, full duplex conversation where you can interrupt and interact um, in real time from both sides over time. And so these are just, um, and probably people would use different. Of flavors of all of this in a really complex AI, but it's just interesting to think about just basic things, right? Can we understand what you're saying, not just sentence by sentence and not just multiple sentences, but like, like how do we push the envelope and really get better there? The other thing that we're looking at at Show Ice, which is pretty neat, is just this, we kind of call it the empathy model. Um, we could probably have a better name for it, but in a conversation, lots of things are happening. 
So sometimes you're listening and you're kind of like, uh-huh, uh-huh, like, okay, whatever, whatever you're saying. And then you notice somebody says something like, um, oh, I'm going to go to a college visit. So that's a moment for you to kind of engage. It's not quite a question, but you might clarify with a question. Um, you want to know the situation someone's in. I'm kind of like walking through these. Um, and you kind of go back and forth between all these different techniques of listening, answering, um, providing more prompts so people might say more and things like that. And so we have a whole classification that we're looking at of just different ways to understand how are, how are people conversing. Um, and then that's more on the chit chat side. And then we're also looking at deeper, what we might say, skills. So every morning at 9.30 a.m., uh, Xiao Ace in China um, goes through, like, she, she, she not only helps you do silly things like count sheep and do math and recognize movie stars, but she's also giving you, like, finance. So you can kind of customize what you like. But um, we've been really going deep on some of these skills. And um, it's just been really interesting to see how good can we get on some of these um, domain verticals, like uh, for her finance skill. Um, she's been doing finance briefings for many, many days. And we're just trying to see how good can we get, how close to human parity can we get, how much can people rely on this, um, how much should they not rely on it, and, and so forth. Um, but one of my really favorite things that Xiao Weiss does, which I think is also interesting, is just, can, would you trust it enough that you would let Xiao Weiss tell your kid a story? Can we, can we make an AI that will do simple things, um, make poetry? So in Chinese, poetry is a really, um, you know, the language is really beautiful. And so poetry ties the symbolism of the language with um, the way it sounds, uh, melody, songs, things like that. So we're, we're, we're trying to um, really get at more human things and kind of push the boundaries um, with show eyes. Uh, and of course, she's super famous, actually. She's got like her own TV show. Like I said, she appears in a video. She's just kind of a, there's like a whole thing going on there. Um, so, so this is, in a sense, our experiment for um, some AI that Microsoft runs first party to say, like, how far can we push the boundary? Can we take risk? Um, can we really learn? And then how quickly can we take some of those learnings and make them available um, to people, to anybody, really, you know, um, who wants to code and make this their own? But that's kind of my Xiao Ai story. The main thing that I would say there is, you know, our goals there are, you know, our long-term vision is if we want to integrate AI into our everyday life, um, we really need to learn a lot more about modeling human conversation and be pretty open about that and open to experiment. And we have to think not just about getting tasks done, but um, social skills and emotional skills. Because the moment you have a voice, people attach those feelings to it. And so I think we can do better there. And then just, you know, how does this AI help people have positive relationships? I mean, one of the things that happens with Xiao Ice is lots of people in a room will talk to her. Can she understand different voices, react differently, um, just like a person does if you're a child versus an elderly person, a man, a woman? And, you know, there's a lot of um, questions that are associated with that, of, of giving AI personality. And then just, again, how do we take all of that take the things that really work and really make them robust so that lots of other people can do this for their companies. So this is my third story. Um, we thought initially, I think two and a half years ago, we launched a product called the Bot Framework, which lets you create your own conversational experiences with open source on GitHub. And we thought that it would be a lot of you know, open source developers and experiment, people experimenting who would use this first and really to our surprise, almost every enterprise customer that we work with um, wanted to integrate AI into their company and really focus on um, you know, a younger audience, maybe, who is used to chatting, and then just wanting to say, like, hey, you know, we haven't designed our company. You know, we designed our store, maybe, so that people would want to come in, but our web pages, our apps, we didn't really design them as an entry point to our customers. And people don't actually like talking to us that much. You know, I mean, it's sometimes you feel like picking up the phone and calling help desk, but often you don't. It's not really a joyful experience. And, and we want to make sure that if our customers have questions or want to um, get a new feature, that that, that experience is really um, personal and, and um, 
and exciting. And then on the other hand, we also have office and people are like, you know, and by the way, we have all these line of business apps, sometimes getting work done and sharing information in our companies is just way harder than it should be. Can we use conversational AI as a way to stitch together this um, stuff that we have, like we wish we'd been collecting data in a certain way and built apps in a certain way. Can you help us use AI to build a future? And by the way, we want to own our future. We want to own our data. And you know, we don't really want you looking at that. We don't, it's great that you have your show eyes, but we want our own brand and our own company. Um, you know, this is what we're going to build our future on, and so we need to be in control of it. Um, so, so we've just been having a blast actually working with people and understanding what people have and listening to customers. And I think the things that we have as tenants really are that you know companies want and should be in control of the user experience and their AI story, um, control of their data, and you know obviously their customers, the the promise that they make to their customers, and that their assistance really should go anywhere their customers are. Um, and so I think that's really had us. Um, think a little bit differently about AI, um, how we gather data, um, how we help, um, how we can build AI that requires less data, how we do things, um, um, storing things in your own, um, you know, subscription, and then obviously how things can work globally because there's a lot of different policy regulations um, in different countries, and just how do we we make sure that any AI system that you're doing, um, you know matches all the privacy and security constraints that you need. Um, so I think just uh, we've all experienced while the space is just totally growing. I mean, there are, uh, you know, probably a pretty big overlap of our 300,000 developers using our tools and Google's and, and Amazon's. Um, but it's, it's super interesting to see how many people are using this, how many companies are using this, and you know, just how many people are experimenting and really getting stuff out quickly. So one of the things that we just launched two weeks ago at our developer conference is um, we, we have a group at Microsoft that will help you build. Um, if, you don't wanna, if you don't have developers in your company, you can come to us and we can either hook you up with service integrators or people at Microsoft who will build an assistant for you. And we basically just took all of the stuff that they do and released it open source on GitHub. So if you want to try your own assistant, you can kind of get up and going with a lot of the solutions that we provide. So basically, it lets you create your own assistant um, that uh, can surface through on many different channels, like Facebook or Slack or Skype or um, on SMS and play through on different devices. And then we have a whole set of skills um, that people can reuse and leverage, including um, skills that you make yourself or skills that you've made on other platforms. And we connect that through to the knowledge platform and let you um, plug in third-party assistance. So a lot of people want to plug in um, other assistants and other apps. And then we also make sure that all this can run on the edge. Um, so that's really awesome. And then, of course, all of that leverage is on our cloud, um, but you can also put a lot of this on any cloud you want. And, um, and so those are kind of the, the framework and the tools that people are using. And, and uh, again, a lot of the common pieces are just the ability to create these conversational apps, the ability to do natural language query, speech, language, answer questions, translation. Um, you can use all of these components either to create conversational experiences or um, to create a conversational app. Um, so I'm not going to go through all this. We have a whole suite of tools um, really taking you through planning, um, building, um, testing your thing, rolling it out, connecting to your audience, kind of evaluating and really quickly um, learning through um, you know, what people really do. And again, I think it is early. And so one of the things that we would encourage you to do is just try stuff out. You know, you're, it's just like um, back in the day when people were creating web pages. Um, first of all, if you, if you don't have any of these experiences that you use that you think are good, like we really encourage you to try using them. Otherwise, it's like designing a web page, never have seen the internet. It's really hard. <laughs> and so, and a lot of customers trying AI tools out or conversational tools out, you know, they, they haven't really used them either. So I think um, try stuff out. We've designed stuff to be really fluid. And then, um, you know, and really learn from there. Uh, we have a lot of, of customers, obviously, around the world trying things out. You know, we're trying to pull together a lot of the assets that we have. 
So we're pretty much all in on open source. Um, GitHub is a great uh, resource, and so we're really working well um, with the GitHub community. We have Azure, Microsoft Research, which is probably the most open or one of the most open research organizations um, in the world, as well as a lot of the world data we have through search, um, work data that we have from LinkedIn and Office, and then just data that you have around your customers. So this is kind of my last slide. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think our goal and maybe all of your goals is like we hope that in the future there are many, many, many thriving, awesome companies who's, who, who have been able to do things that, with their customers and their businesses that they um, can never have done without the tools that we provide. And so, you know, we hope there isn't a world in the future where there's only like four companies that are AI experts and everybody else kind of has to just use that. So we really encourage you if you have any questions, um, thinking about your digital transformation or, or what you're doing, um, you know, it's our, it's all of our, I think, goal to, to support a, a wide number of companies and scenarios. And that really means enabling you to own your AI future, your data, um, and then making sure your customers have experiences that really live up to the promise of artificial intelligence, which again, like I said, with the Xiao Ice project and the things that we're doing there, really are more human. I mean, we might say that that first slide that I showed you was a dialogue system. We would say it's a pretty bad one, probably, the command line. Um, but in some sense, when you think of the state of the art of assistance today, they're still very, very primitive. And so, um, and so I think that's actually fine. It's a good way to get started. But we're really, um, we're really excited about this because I believe that in the future, the short future, um, any experience that you have, if you don't do more with what your user is saying or typing or typing or tapping in your user experience, um, people will think it's broken. So you don't want to have a broken experience. Today, if you type into your keyboard, if there were no words and autocomplete, you know, it didn't give you your little emoji when you type like birthday and show a little cake. Um, you're like, what's wrong with this keyboard? It's like so dumb. Doesn't understand the word that I might type in or doesn't understand my name, my dictionary, the words that I use in my company. The, like, I mean, that stuff is just going to be commonplace or autocomplete in search. If you typed and it didn't give you like the most common things that the world is typing in that's relevant with memory of yourself in like two letters, you'd be like, this autocomplete search box is just bad. And so we're already using AI. Um, and I think this will just increase as people are using your website, your app, coming, calling you on the phone, um, interacting with you face to face in your store. If you don't have um, better, if you don't do more with people input um, and make that more human and natural, um, the, the experiences will just feel lousy. And so uh, we want to make them awesome. And uh, like I said, I think even when you think the desktop still doesn't actually have a back button on it, and you can't find everything the way you should. Um, so there's lots of low hanging fruit and ways that we can make our experiences better. And um, we're really excited to be here. And uh, thank you for being here. And let, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.